Um, so we will go through uh, lightning talks. Um, those one are five minutes long, and uh, so I'm going to cut like people if they they go over time. And so be nice to them. Uh, uh, it might be stressful if someone uncovers that. Um, we will have nine nine talks. Uh, the first of one, uh, the first four of them are about tools that. Uh, uh, from the Bezel team and, the, and some other team at Google that made uh, to you to make Bezel uh, easier to use, and uh, also some new features of Bezel. And then we will enter like more prospective to, uh, talks, and we have uh, some interesting build system and uh, and also some new ideas that are going to be pitched. Uh, we, uh, so there is. Uh, just a note for uh, the speakers, if uh, you're next, uh, just come next to me so I know uh, where is the next speaker. And uh, right now we're going to start with uh, Laurent, who is going to talk about uh, Buildifier and Buildozer. Um, um, I am uh, Laurent. Uh, on, uh, is it working? Yeah? yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> on the Bazel team. So I, am, I work on, on Skylark and uh, tools for build files and, and other BCL files. So um, this talk is about Buildifier and Buildozer. So just a quick question. How many of you know about Buildifier? Wow, a lot. And how many of you are using it? <laughs> yeah, OK. So, so the, the, that will be simple. So, the, so, so for those of you who don't know about it, Buildifier is just a code formatter for the build files. So just uh, something like uh, Go format, Clang format, or uh, other things you have in other languages. So you just write your build file, you run Buildifier, and it will format it in a, in a nice and st uh, standard way. And so, well, so, so that means that all the build files will will look the same. So it's much easier to to uh, to to read them. But the most important thing is that um, since all the build files are formatted in the same way, that means that they can be modified automatically. And so tools that modify the build files don't have to care about um, indent indentation or keeping the, the comments in the right place or everything like this. And so, so yeah, so, so that's just an, an example of a, a build file formatted with Buildifier. So that's simple. And so the other tool is Buildozer, which um, which is used to actually uh, modify the build files automatically. So I, I will just go through a few examples. Uh, you, you can later look at the documentation to, to know all the details. But just a quick overview, that if you just call Buildifier, uh, Buildozer, uh, there's a command called add. And then you, you specify which uh, in which attribute you want to add something, and so in this example you add um, a, de a dependency on the slash slash base um, uh, for the two rules uh, package colon rule and pa package colon rule two. So you just run this command and it will automatically update the, the build files. Um, so this is to, to add one, one dependency. You can also modify uh, an existing attribute. So he has to modify the de default visibility, visibility um, in a build file. So it will modify the, on, the package, on the package line. So it will check um, if you have already declared package or not. And if not, it will create a new one, and it will modify the default visibility. So this one is to replace some attributes. So if you have a... Um, uh, the depth, which is a list of de dependencies, and you want to replace um, dependency on package v1 and to update it to package v2, you just want this command. And so there is a nice thing is that if you rename a package, rename a target, or if you want to update it to a new version, you, you can just run this command um, uh, on uh, every build file in, in your code base, and it will update everything. So. Um, so in this example, um, uh, we use a star at the end to, to say, oh, uh, uh, every, every target in the build file. And so this example will remove the test only attribute for every target in the build file, so everywhere it's defined. Um, you can also add some comments. So here, if you want to add a comment deprecated to some target, 
Um, you can also print some information. So build design is not just about uh, updating the build files. It's also um, useful to, to print information from the, from the build file. So if you want to print the name of every CC binary target in the file, you can run this command. So this percent means every target of the kind uh, CC binary here in this example. You can also print other information like the start, start line and end line of the definition in the build file. You could also print the, uh, the label or print the rule, which, which is a complete definition, or print any attribute from the, from the target. You can also, um, so this is the same example as before, sorry. <laughs> Um, you can also insert a new uh, load uh, statements uh, in a file. So here, if you want to to, to load uh, my macro from the from this PCL file, just as this, um, you can also the set command is to um, also so here so here set kind of my macro um, is to replace every Java library in the build file. And and uh, and um, uh, replace a Java library with a macro. Um, and this is to delay it some some old target. So, so this is the end of my examples. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. So yeah. So the next slide is just um, the, uh, the 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 GitHub page. Uh, thank you, Laurel. So now, Fabian, does that work? Yes. Fabian is going to talk about a linter for Skylark. Oh, you're on site, you. on the page. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Fabian Seiser, and I have been an intern on the uh, Basel team. And uh, over the last three months, I have been implementing a linter for the Skylark language, like a static analyzer. And in this talk, I just want to uh, show you quickly uh, what it's capable of and how you can use it. So uh, I made up this artificial example of a Skylark file. Uh, sorry for the, it's so artificial, but yeah, it's here to showcase all uh, what the linter can do. So there's a lot of things that are bad about this. Um, for example, it's missing all kinds of doc strings. So um, first of all, we need, need a doc string at the top of the file describing what the file does. Uh, also, we have a public function foo. Uh, this should also have a doc string, at least, at least if it's longer than, uh, yeah, usually functions are longer than this, so yeah. Uh, also, load statements should be at the top of the file uh, because they're just like input statements. And um, in addition, um, we have a couple of naming conventions in Skydog. So usually, uh, variable names should be snake case, so all the words are separated by underscores. Um, so the first global variable violates this rule. Um, providers are different. Provider names should be uh, upper camel case because they're basically like type names in Python. Um, and they should also have the suffix info. The linter also wants about this. And uh, if you look down below, we have a variable there that um, shadows a built-in. So the list function is a built-in. And that's not a good thing to do because it's just confusing um, to do that. So the linter also wants about this. And uh, a bit more complicated examples. Um, so the variable at the top um, starts with an underscore. That means it's a private variable. It's not exported. And uh, it's never used in that file, so we can just say it's useless. And uh, yeah, the linter puts this. Um, also, in the load statement, we're loading a function that's never used in that file. Uh, that is also something that doesn't make sense. So the linter warns about it. Um, the next lint is a bit special. So we see that the function has two return um, statements. And in one, it returns a value. And the other one, there is no value, which might indicate a bug in the program. Um, so if you actually want to return none, which is what the return statement does, you just write return none to make it clear what your intent is. Um, and the final problem uh, we're seeing here is that the variable list is, uh, may not have been initialized. It's just initialized in one branch of the statement. And uh, the linter also catches that. Yeah, so those are some examples of what it can do. And uh, if you want to use it, uh, the linter is part of the Bazel repository. To run it, you just use Bazel run and then this long target name. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> just search for Scarlet and you'll find it. Um, yeah, uh, documentation is also available since like two days ago, I think, um, on that address, or just search for Scarlet again. 
Um, feedback on the usual channels, issue tracker, basal discuss, Google Groups. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
When a Go project has 50 plus transitive dependencies, it's a real pain to build a workspace file for that. Um, th this is actually a problem that every language has, I think. So we're planning on having Gazelle be able to add, update, and remove uh, dependencies based on which import paths could or could not be resolved in the current repository. Overall, Gazelle's made developing Go code within Bazel a lot simpler. Uh, I hope we can eventually make migrating Go projects to Bazel as painless as possible. Uh, Gazelle is part of Rules Go, so it's, it's in this repository now. So if you're building Go code, check us out. Thank you. And right on time. <laughs> so next is uh, Julie. So Julie is working on our, uh, uh, on our configurability team uh, inside uh, the Bezel team. And she's going to talk about uh, platform and select and how you, you can uh, make multi-platform works. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie. Like Damian said, I work on the Bazel team in New York. And today I'll be talking about um, basically what Jay just mentioned in terms of adding platforms to select. So if you're unfamiliar with um, select or configurable attributes in general, configurable attributes is a really cool feature that Blaze has that allows you to select some of the values of your build rule attributes um, based on command line flags. So as you can see here, um, select statements are maps of labels to potential values your attributes could have. And um, the labels are representative of config settings, which are essentially just collections of command line flags. So this particular invocation is how you would get the x86 source.sh um, file for your sources attribute. So what we've added that Jay mentioned is um, platforms. So um, a lot of people today have already talked about platforms. Um, but just to nail down what I'm talking about in this particular instance, um, a platform is just a device that you can run a program on, right? So like Bazel, a compiler, or an executable. And um, it's particularly important for us to be able to talk about platforms in our build rules today because um, we not only have uh, traditional builds where your Bazel and your compiler run on the same device as your executable, but we now have um, builds where your Bazel and your compiler are actually compiling for a different device, um, as is the case in Android and iOS apps. So those devices are just platforms, right? And the way that we've defined platforms in build rules um, is with these three new rules called platform, constraint setting, and constraint value. Um, and um, constraint settings are variables you might care about that might affect your build, such as the operating system or a particular version of a compiler or the presence of a GPU, something like that. And the example I have here is operating system. And constraint values are just potential values those settings could have. And platforms are just collections of those constraint values. So the way platform um, links into traditional config settings is if you saw this config setting and wanted to see if it was a match, you would just check if it had the same constraint values as a platform you have in your build files. And if it does, um, if that platform has the same constraints or a superset, you see if it's the same one that's triggered by your experimental platforms flag. And if so, it's considered a match. Um, so we've seen a lot of complicated selects in the presentations already today. And I don't think anybody here has like an innate love for complicated build files. So you may be wondering why this is so important. And Jay already mentioned it, but um, this is actually the same slide he just used. Um, so the Go Rules team at Google is using this, um, particularly for toolchain selection. And that's a huge use case for platforms in general. Um, because if you choose the wrong toolchain, like as we know, your build just fails. Um, because it looks at a source that doesn't really work out. So um, before platforms existed, uh, this selection was done on the CPU flag. And sometimes the CPU flag is a good proxy for which tool chain you want. Um, and sometimes it's not. And when it fails, it's really annoying to figure out um, what happened and how to debug your build because it'll only fail for a certain like operating system architecture combinations. You don't really know what that one was. And often the CPU flag is just inferred. Um, from the basal architecture. So it's really annoying. And now you have the specificity to just decide exactly which tool chain you want or um, which tool you want in other scenarios where you might want a platform. Um, if you want to hear more about platforms, I think like four people have already plugged this talk, but John Cater will be talking about it tomorrow in a breakout session. And that should be really awesome. And I think that's all I have for you today. Cool. <laughs> Thanks.
<laughs> with Dana was working on our uh, Android uh, roles in the Bezel, uh, in the right. Bezel team. Yes. And you're on. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I uh, hope you've been having a good day. Uh, as Damian said, my name is Donna. I work on the Bazel Android roles at Google. Uh, as many people have mentioned today, testing is very important. But right now, there are no uh, Android rules, Android testing rules in Bazel. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about a new rule that will be released soon um, that will enable you to unit test your Android apps. Um, this rule is called Android Local Test. Yeah. Um, so Android Local Test works closely with a testing framework called RoboElectric. Um, Android apps run on your phone on a device. And so generally, you would want to test your app on the device. However, this is often very slow. And so it would be great if there was an additional alternative. And that is where RoboElectric comes in. So RoboElectric runs Android framework code directly inside of the JVM on your computer, which enables you to run tests much faster than on a device uh, in a similar environment to the one that's on your phone. Um, so let's take a look at what an actual rule looks like. So here we have an Android local test. In the sources, you have the test code itself. And in the depths, you have all of your dependencies, including the code that you want to be testing. And if anyone's ever written a Java test, this might look suspiciously similar. And so you may wonder, why not just use Java test? But as I mentioned, this rule it enables you to test your Android code. And a critical difference between Android code and Java code is that Android has resources and manifests that need to be treated specially. And um, this rule treats those things as equal citizens to the Java code itself. Um, yes. Uh, so previously, previous versions of RoboElectric did its own custom resource processing. But the resource processing that it did was often different than the resource processing that the build system did. Um, and so with this rule, the rule itself does the resource processing and then hands off those artifacts to RoboElectric. And so now this rule does this resource processing in the same way that your Android library and your Android binary does resource processing. And so you know that you are testing the same thing that you're going to be releasing. Moreover, when RoboElectric did the resource processing, it had to do this with every single test invocation. But with the rule doing it, we can take advantage of Bazel's incrementality. And so your tests are uh, not only correct, but also faster. Uh, yes, OK. Now I'm going to attempt to do a live demo. Does this microphone also work? Because I need both my hands. OK. <laughs> okay. Can everyone still hear me? Great. OK. And it's tiny. OK. Um, so is this visible at all? Yes. Great. OK, so this is an example RoboElectric test. And what it's testing, if you look at line 25, that's where the interesting stuff starts. So it's testing that you have this button. And when you click on this button, it asserts that the app informs us that the ice cream is ready. Um, so <laughs> here we have this test, that's what we want it to do. And so if we run our test, uh, so we'll test it. And oh, this one you can't see. OK, well, aha. OK, well, the test, the test failed. Uh, <laughs> so um, if we go and we look at what the code is doing, aha. Well, on line 20, it seems like uh, someone forgot to actually implement the uh, ice cream generation. And so if we do this, and save it, and run the test again. Yay! OK. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> oh, <okay>. uh, 
great. So test driven development is something that's uh, pretty useful. So this hopefully will make it possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So we're going to stop a bit for, with Googlers. I think you got, you got enough of them. <laughs> so yeah. So um, Paul uh, is working for Probref, which is a publication uh, service. Yes. And where's the clicker? Uh, yes, it's there. Uh, okay. All set. Thank you. My name is Paul. So I'm going to talk briefly about the build event protocol. So as you might imagine, the build event protocol is a specification for producing and consuming build events. So in this case, Bazel is the producer of these events. And if you want to integrate with it, you build an application to consume these events and Bazel will publish them to you. So in my case, experimenting with an alternative user interface to Bazel, you can imagine it might be useful in a number of different scenarios. I'll list it here or whatever is you know, in your, on your mind. So for my little demo application, uh, this is what we have. There's pretty much two takeaways. One is that if you have anyone else to make diagrams for your slides, you should do that. I did not. <laughs> two is that uh, writing or uh, drawing the Go Gopher in colored pencil is super fun and it will totally uh, improve your day. So I encourage everyone to do that. <laughs> um, so what we're doing here is we're basically making a quest from the browser um, using gRPC web, which is kind of a new protocol. Um, and what we're doing on the server then is we're going to use OS execute to uh, call Bazel build with this BES backend flag, which is going to name the uh, host and port number where we want events to be posted to. So when Bazel runs, it's going to, uh, it's going to publish those events over two gRPC endpoints, uh, and then we'll use channels to kind of funnel those back to our original request, and then uh, push those back up to the browser. Um, so if you want to use it, uh, there's a, kind of two different ways to invoke it here. And I would encourage, if you have no interest in the build event protocol at all, uh, try build something at least once with this Bazel build build event JSON file and just give it any file name and then look at the output because there's a, kind of a wealth of information in there and you're going to learn something you didn't know before. Um, I would also encourage everyone to check out, there's a pretty decent blog post on the Bazel documentation about the protocol, so you should read that as well. Um, one of the confusing aspects about the build event protocol is that it's defined really in two different places. So when you invoke Bazel with this BES backend flag, you're getting events that are defined in this published build event profile, which is uh, housed in the Google APIs repo. Whereas if you invoke it with these, this other flag, build event text file, you get events um, that's more represent sort of a build graph in this build event stream profile, which is in the Bazel repo itself. So I think you know it's a little a moving target, work in progress. I would defer to a Bazel team member to kind of you know give us more information about where it's going eventually, but. Um, so these are some of the kind of events you will get. Um, the lifecycle events are sort of these sort of generic builds has been queued, um, uh, various things. And then there's these tool events, um, which is this ordered build event. It's kind of a generic wrapper uh, that you uh, can extract these other events, which are the build graph. And those are pretty interesting uh, and have a lot of information in them. So here's just our animated GIF of the, of the application going and demonstrating that yet indeed we can um, consume the build event protocol from within a browser and uh, build targets, you know. So um, there's a lot more information I haven't shown here. So with that, i um, happy to answer any questions. And this is my GitHub if you, um, you know, probably open source this at some point, but it's still a little dirty. So thank you. Next is uh, Arve. So Arve is actually a Googler, but is working in the Envoy team. That's right. And, uh, is going to uh, talk about uh, conversion of Envoy to Bazel. OK. Um, hi. Yeah, so I'm Harvey Tuch. I work at Google. And I want to talk a little bit about the trials and tribulations that we went through converting Envoy to Bazel. So first of all, what is Envoy? Well, it's an open source project. It's um, Primarily a sort of service mesh uh, proxy designed for modern microservice architectures, also used as an edge proxy 
is developed on GitHub by Google, Lyft, and other contributors like Apple, Stripe. Um, very, I mean, it's just growing all the time. It's a mid-sized C++ project, and we use what I would consider modern C++ best practices. So, yes. Um, before I address the right-hand side of this slide, um, one thing I like to say is like working at Google is like really awesome, and one of the reasons it's awesome is because we get to work with great infrastructure, including amazing code search, these uh, sort of remote execution farms we talked about today, and technology like Basil and Blaze, which was like pretty sort of awe-inspiring coming into for industry. Um, on the right-hand side of this slide is Matt Klein. He's the project founder and chief of Envoy. He works at Lyft. He is exasperated at probably looking at one of my pull requests as we made this transition. And so the question is, you know, uh, how did this experience go? So this took place over about two months, um, this transition. It was about 100 commits, about 24,000 lines of code of churn, um, and quite a lot of hair pulling along the way. Now there's some things which are sort of inherent in any of these migrations, and we've heard about them today in the various examples that we've seen. These include things like, um, you know, expressing your dependency graph as built files, and we wanted to come up with a very sort of tight set of dependencies and a fine granularity. We built some tooling to help with this along the way. We needed to make our tests hermetic, so they would execute with Basil's parallel uh, execution architecture. Hermetic tests are a good thing, full stop. Uh, we accepted that this was necessary work. And all of this actually wasn't too bad. This was actually pretty straightforward. And once we had done a few manual examples, we could automate most of this away. Um, so where things were a bit tougher, and this is, again, we've heard this across many languages today, dealing with external dependencies. So these are uh, the transitive dependencies of uh, Envoy. And you can see it's, it's just really confusing and complex, and in particular because this is C++. We have various build systems at, at work here. Um, this isn't just a, a homogenous thing like a Maven, for example. You know, we have CMake, we have Autoconf, some of these dependencies are Basel native dependencies already. Some of these are trivial, uh, convertible to Basel. We took the approach similar to SpaceX and not similar to um, TensorFlow, where we wanted to express these uh, external dependencies using the native build systems. So we thought that would be more scalable and also just more correct fundamentally. You know, Many of these ad hoc uh, build rules that are written for external dependencies don't cover tests. And so it's, and there's very subtle bugs that can creep in when you basically try and build um, a parallel build system, which isn't you know, vetted by CI and so on. OK, other fun things. So uh, this was essentially the long tail trying to hit parity with CMake. So, you know, introducing the Git SHA for the provenance of the build, surprisingly tricky under Basel. We actually had to write a tool which did rewriting of ALF had as a binary rewriting tool to do what in CMake is one line. Coverage was a big pain point for us. C++ coverage is not supported today in Basel and uh, involves heroics to make work. It's really important for any serious C++ project, in particular one which values correctness and uh, uh, code quality. Uh, we run on a bunch of different platforms, Linux primarily. Mac OS involved us forking the uh, Basel C++ toolchain auto configure scripts because of some of the limitations there with uh, certain kinds of stripping and static uh, uh, library builds today. Um, there's various AMD 64 strings hard coded into various things, uh, uh, rules that we've consumed for um, Basil. It's been a problem for folks working on uh, uh, PowerPC and IBM. We're hopefully going to be using Basil Windows soon. So this is an average Envoy developer who is not a Googler and is not an expert in Basil. They just want to debug the build when things go wrong. They um, want to extend it in the same way that they would uh, hack on make and, and so on. Very confused. So why are they confused? Well, errors like this. This is kind of what you get when things go wrong in Basel today. Uh, the root cause, for example, is up there at the top. What we actually is manifest and we see in our um, issues open on GitHub is at the bottom there. So I want to actually just wrap this up by, again, reiterating that Basel is awesome source. It is technology for the future when it, and, uh, when it works, and it does work um, most of the time. We need to do things around the rough edges to make this better for the open source C++ community. OK, with that said, um, we're probably out of time for questions. But um, uh, yeah, I'd love to talk more about this at drinks or elsewhere at the conference. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Sue Sun Lai. So 
is coming from PayPal and is going to present uh, the home build system. And yeah. you're Thank all you. set. Okay. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, my name is Xun Lai, so from PayPal build team. So sitting there is Terry, our product manager, and Goro, our project manager. So you guys are lucky if you are able to migrate to Bazel, but that's not the case with us. We have a 40 million lines of codes, a legacy C++ code base dated back to 1999. So in 2014, we ran out of all the solutions to reduce the build time further. So we have to, the build time, we have two types of builds. So the full build of the whole code base which consists of 900 RPMs. It took 30 minutes on a monster machine with 80 CPUs. And developer builds of individual applications on smaller machines took 45 minutes. So we have to redesign our new build system from ground up, but we have the requirement. We cannot change a single line of the source codes. We continue to support the existing build definition language. So we have a wrapper around the make file system. So people don't maintain make files, but they have to maintain that build definition language. So we continue to support that we have to. So it's a drop in replacement of the existing build system. In 2015, we achieved the goal. We released a new build system. We brought down the build time to be less than five minutes for all the build activities. And one thing is the design was greatly influenced and inspired by Basil. Actually, not Basil Place. We went through a couple of articles published by Google in 2011. I think I read it, read them through like 50 times. Yeah, so it worked the, the whole design, but it's it's very difficult for our challenging for our code base. And early this year, we started the piloting the distributed build. So we have a solution built on Mesos and the distributed build without any incremental. It's below 10 minutes to build the whole code base. The main reason is just because some files took eight minutes to compile. So it's not about the parallelism, it's just limited by some terrible files. And we, <laughs> <laughs> so we apply the same technology to do the functional test written in Maven test ng. We don't like Maven, but we have to continue to support it. And we brought down many functional tests from hours down to minutes. So the main design behind Bazel is all about rule level dependencies. So you define all the rules, but we, our code base is a still make file oriented. So everything is file level depend, dependencies. So how do we convert file level to rule level? One way is we can roll some, we can write some tool to convert them once and then ask developers to maintain later, but that's impossible for us with a 40 million lines of code. And also one time we wrote a tool to try to make make CC library as the smallest unit. That didn't work. We ended up with libraries with circular dependencies. Each one needs header file from each other or just logical library with a single header file, nothing else. Then we relaxed the, the rule actually to the smallest unit in our system actually is just object file, it's not library and we convert all the root file level dependencies on the fly to root level dependencies. So there's, we continue to support everything ex existing, but we convert them internally on the fly. Then this is the way the approach we did, I, I call it deferred discovery of root dependencies. In most of the build systems today, you have, you, you pass the dependency, then you have the DAG, then, then you start the execution. But in our case, we cannot do that. Either it's too slow to have the whole deck or it's impossible for some cases. For example, rule one need, depends on a file. Then you ask the framework, which rule can give me that file? <laughs> then the framework will ask all the rules in bad path. You need to tell me the exact list of your generated files. Then rule two is easy to tell. It immediately knows. But rule three needs actually a, a, actual execution to give the list of the files. So that's the main idea. Then content-based incremental build is similar to Google's design and like meta system to metadata system to maintain the action hash, artifact storage, 
then share across all users, developer builds, CI builds, then distributed build, we are piloting that, and it's a, it's a working solution, naturally, yeah. Then I think that's it. Thank you. So next is our uh, last talk by uh, uh, Oscar Boykin. So I don't need to reintroduce you because you're <laughs> already talking. And he's going to talk about two proposals he has to uh, improve Bazel. Yeah, so um, I don't know if I have to you know, hold this thing because I'm going to paste around. Um, does, it, do, does anyone here use a, a programming language that you really like? It isn't currently supported by Bazel. Like, you know, like raise your hand if you like, like some programming language that isn't supported by Bazel. So there's like a couple of people. So we're like weirdos. Maybe you like Haskell or, you know, you want, you know, I don't know, like Erlang or something. But if you go to try to implement rules for uh, for Bazel, uh, I, I, I worked on this with Scala. You find it's pretty painful. So I'm going to talk about two things that, like, I, I think would really help. I would really like to see added. So the main thing is it's really hard to add compiler rules. So Here's the thing, to get reasonable performance, you need this somewhat C-like model. I alluded to this earlier, that you have some separation between interface and like generated code. Most languages actually don't have that. Like Python doesn't have that if you think about it. Like just start, like almost no language has it except other than C. So I guess they had make and everything and C had this property and they were like, oh, everything will just have this property. It's not actually true. So if you work around this, um, like say in Java, like you know, it, it kind of like maybe you can make it work. Uh, if you implement, you've got IJAR sitting around. It's like this tool I mentioned earlier. But if you go to try to use it, like for instance, there's some Haskell like programming language on the JVM called Frega from Gottlieb Frega, some logician. It compiles to Java code. So I'm like, oh, it shouldn't be that hard to support it in Bazel. So I'll just whip it up. And so actually, though, like for like in different reasons, this became extremely hard and it like totally sucks. So like Bazel's answers to this are like, oh, no problem. Just like get the compiler author to change the way it works, which the compiler, compiler author doesn't care about Bazel. So they're like, screw you, not going to do it. Um, Option two is build a new IJAR. Like, yeah, okay, like no problem. Again, like this is like a huge amount of effort to build something that works as well as that. Like that's not such a great answer. Um, and that's still fooling the compiler. So so the, the IJAR trick is to fool the compiler into like, I'll give you something other than like binary code, but somehow when the compiler reads it, it thinks it is binary code and somehow doesn't trip over the fact that there is no binary there. So Java happens to be foolable in this way. A lot of compilers are not gonna be foolable in that way. Um, or the last answer is you just live with trans transitive rebuilds. You make some private change to a comment in some random file, and then like no problem, it just like recompiles your graph. Like that's really really sad. So what I would really like to see, which Buck already has, so like I don't know if like competition like gets people upset or something, is the ability to configure the rule key. So what I want to be able to say is in my rule, in my Skylark rule, it says, okay, here's how you compile Scala. I want to be able to say, like, by default, we leave it the way it is, SHA-256, the artifact or whatever. Um, but I want to be able to say, here is an object which is a key object for this object code. And then Bazel is free to give me any object code which has the exact same key value. If this existed, I could use this SBT tool that already has this notion of extracting an API for Scala, though it cannot compile against it, it can extract it. I could just plug that in, boom, I can get like really awesome rebuilds. It would be amazing. Buck has it, let's do that. That would be amazing. Okay, uh, problem two, as I mentioned before, is that I love languages with slow, slow compilers. This really sucks. Bazel wants a static graph for a lot of cool reasons. For instance, Bazel uh, the query, which is like pretty awesome. So what do I want to do about this? So what I want is something like this. I would love for this, if you're interested in like C++, pretty slow compiler. Rust, pretty slow compiler. Haskell, pretty slow compiler. What I want to be able to do is declare my inputs and outputs. I depend on these libraries, these sources, and I'm going to produce this library output. But I want a rule to be able to dynamically, after running, inspecting the sources, produce more transit, more of a little hidden black box node inside that Bazel could understand the depths for. If Bazel could understand the depths for, it could manage the caching there, and I wouldn't get a benefit. Like Bazel could give me the whole benefit that I get for other build tools that know about this. If we could add this, we could kind of get the best of both worlds of like a fairly static graph that we could query, but also Bazel owning like 
like sub target, like, you know, like sub module notions of a graph. That would be awesome. So those are my two like proposals. I would love to like work with anybody who's interested in this on maybe some design docs. And if like, maybe we can work together for some PRs or maybe just the Google, the Googlers would be like, yeah, that's awesome. I'll just do that next week. And that'll be great. <laughs>